Good morning, everybody. I am Jeannie Lee. I'm the executive director of DC Ed Fund. Thank you so much for being here with us this morning. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, DC Ed Fund is DCPS's primary philanthropic partner. And um, our job is to connect philanthropy with DCPS's most innovative solutions and strategies for kids. Um, instead of me talking to you and telling you all about it, what I'd love to do is show you. For decades, DC Public Schools was one of the worst performing districts in the nation. In 2007, mayoral control was established in DC. A new chancellor of schools was appointed, and the DC Public Education Fund was founded to help. For decades, DC Public Schools was one of the worst performing districts in the nation. In 2007, mayoral control was established in DC. A new chancellor of schools was appointed, and the DC Public Education Fund was founded to help DCPS address its most pressing challenges. Over the last decade, the DC Ed Fund established a unique investment model that enabled DCPS to make big bets in areas like human capital, curriculum, and experiential learning. And these bets have paid off. Every student achievement indicator is accelerating in the right direction, and education experts consider DCPS a model of improvement and innovation. Our funders and partners are driving change and making this dramatic transformation possible. With their continued support, we are transforming public schools in our nation's capital. DC Public Schools is on the rise, and the DC Ed Fund remains by their side. Learn more at dcedfund.org. So, as you saw in the video, um, DC Ed Fund has been around for 10 years, and we've been able to attract over $120 million in new capital to DC, which has been incredible. Um, and we don't plan to stop. Um, while the Ed Fund's primary focus is DC public schools. We also understand that the work that everybody in this room does is part of a much larger system and obviously one city. So I'm thrilled to have um, our local business leaders and our local funders and um, our charter school friends and, of course, uh, our DCPS, our primary partner in the room today. Um, our hope that... Our hope is that at the end of our breakfast today, um, you will all walk out with a closer connection, a closer view into where public education is headed in DC. Um, the next 45 minutes will be a one-on-one -on -one between the mayor and between uh, the mayor and David Rubenstein. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mark Ein. I'm chairman of the DC Public Education Fund, and it's uh, my great honor to introduce two people who in this room definitely need no introduction. Um, they're two extraordinary individuals and we're really lucky that they made the time today to come spend time with us and talk about the district and the state of education in our city. The first is uh, someone who's very important to me, David Rubenstein. He's the reason I'm here. He uh, brought me back to Washington, my hometown, 25 years ago to work at the Carlisle Group. And he is um, one of the most extraordinary individuals um, not just in our city, but in our country. Um, many people dream of having a second act in their life, and I think David's already on his fourth or fifth, sometimes simultaneously. Um, after starting in government, he obviously founded the Carlisle Group and was the entrepreneurial energy and vision behind its growth into becoming the biggest private equity firm in the world. Um, but always to David, and I know because I was there with him in the early days, the real goal was to find a way to give back and get a platform to make a difference in the world. And uh, the run that he's been on in recent years is extraordinary. Nationally, giving to places like Duke and Harvard and Johns Hopkins and University of Chicago. Locally, there's virtually, a, a, there's virtually nothing that's been untouched by him from the Lincoln Memorial to the Washington Monument to the National Archives to uh, the Kennedy Center. But what I really appreciate as much as anything is that he, he appreciates and recognizes the importance of our very, very local community here. And so as much as he does nationally, um, he is very focused on making sure that Washington is the best place it can be and very specifically on education. So under David's leadership, the Economic Club has given 100 David Rubenstein scholarships to graduating seniors of DC schools to help them with their higher education. 
And from DCPF, we're very grateful for David's sponsorship of Standing Ovation and the Rubenstein Awards, where over 300 teachers and principals have gotten over $2 million of awards recognizing their excellence in DC schools. And, and lastly, I just say one of the amazing things about David is for, for all of the money he gives away and the impact he has, he, he shows up. And uh, here we are on a, um, Wednesday morning um, in, Wa- in Washington, and David has done as much for this organization as anyone has ever done, but he's here with us um, with his time, and he's as generous with his time as, as, with his, as with his money. So we're really grateful to have David here. And then um, we're equally grateful to have the mayor of our great city here, um, Mayor Bowser, when she first ran for city council in 2006, made education reform her signature issue. She was the only one of 17 people running for that seat that stood up and said mayoral control, really basic structural reform is is critical to getting the schools where we need, and education's been in the forefront of her work ever since. She's been mayor of our city since 2015. She's done a great job leading our city. We just crossed 700,000 residents in the District of Columbia, which is a big milestone. And, and through that, the mayor, her, her really her number one overarching theme is that every resident of district shares in the prosperity of the city. Um, and many of us are fortunate to live in the great city and, and get the benefits of it. But for the mayor, it's not just that the city's prosperous, but that every single one of those 700,000 people shares in it. And that extends to her views on education. It's not just enough to have a few great schools, but everyone should have access to those great schools. And, um, and we're really grateful for her and her leadership um, on, on those dimensions. Lastly, I'd just say the other thing I appreciate is that she really does want to collaborate. She wants to uh, communicate. And, um, and she was the one who asked for this breakfast this morning. She had called and asked us, could you guys arrange a breakfast so I could talk to people in the city about the state of education? And this was her initiative. And, uh, and I really appreciate not just doing it, but the mindset that goes into that. We're really grateful to have a mayor who thinks, who, 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 who wants to be that transparent and communicated with all of that. <laughs> So with no further introduction, we are really lucky to have David Rubenstein and Mayor Muriel Bowser. Thank you. Well, Mayor, thank you very much for taking the time to do this. My pleasure, David. Thank you for being here and taking the time. And Mark, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, when I'm ready for my eulogy, I know who to call. <laughs> oh, no. So uh, before we talk about education, a couple of things. Uh, okay. You've been mayor for almost four years. Yes. Um, is the job as much fun as you thought it would be before you ran for and became mayor? It's everything I thought it would be uh, and much, much more. I think that uh, the thing, people ask me frequently what surprises you about being mayor. Uh, and probably you can imagine that the volume of big decisions is, is incredible. Uh, and that's, that's what uh, being the mayor is really though, being there to, to make the big decisions. And so uh, we recruited a great team. Uh, we are executing on our agenda. But in cities, uh, cities like ours, big cities, there are always going to be um, big important things that happen. Some you ex- can expect, some that you can't. Uh, that requires the mayor to, to jump in, uh, to let the community know what's going on, and to, to get back to the agenda. So you've been doing it for almost four years, but you think it takes about eight years to get done what you want? Exactly eight right. years, okay. yes. <laughs> okay. So um, let me ask you, on a typical day, um, you know, your meetings, things like this in the office, but if you want to go shopping or go to a restaurant, can you do that without being bothered if people don't come up to you for selfies, or is that? I love selfies. Uh, and the thing about this job is that you have to, you definitely have to, to love it, and you have to love talking to your constituents and residents and business people. You have to want to talk about potholes and schools. Right. Uh, and so you have to, have to do okay. all of those things. And so, so if I had a business and I wanted to relocate my uh, court, uh, the headquarters of it, or at least partial headquarters. Why would Washington be a good place to locate that partial headquarters? 
Well, we think it is the best place uh, to locate. So we, we've been involved in a conversation like this recently, you may have heard. And um, we, we have a good story to tell in our city. And, I, and education is part of that great story. Uh, so when companies are looking to locate, they want to go to cities that are safe and progressive, that are committed to schools and where their employees can have a great quality of life. So they, they were going to make competitive business decisions, but uh, talent uh, is the biggest part of making their business successful, and employees want to be uh, in great cities. So did you have any hint about what uh, Amazon is going to do? They didn't give you a little tip or something? They didn't tell you? Well, we're, we're happy to be on the what I call the long short list. Okay. Uh, and they went from over 200 cities, uh, I think 270 right. cities, right. down to 20. Twenty, uh, and three out of those twenty have Washington D.C. in their name. Okay. Uh, so there's the North Bethesda, Washington D.C. Right. Uh, there's the Northern Virginia, Washington D.C., and then there's Washington D.C. Uh, and so three out of twenty uh, ain't bad. Well, if they were to relocate in Washington D.C., Washington D.C., yes. where would they actually? Well, we, we have four great sites that we proposed, and they're, they're all a little different. Um, they meet Amazon's needs in right. terms of being transit-friendly, where uh, their employees don't need to have a car, where they can get access to airports uh, and roads, where they have access to great parks and recreation right. and arts and, and restaurants and schools. Uh, and so those sites, uh, we have one on the Anacostia, one in Noma, uh, one at Howard University, and one right. in Hill East on Capitol Hill, and they're all great sites. When you're mayor of D.C., does the Congress call you up a lot and tell you what to do, or they largely leave you alone these they days? They almost never call me up. Okay. Uh, we okay. call them up a lot, though, okay. um, because we think, and now we're unique, of course, in the federal system. We're a city, a county, a state, and a school district. Uh, we have 700,000 people who live here now, and we haven't been this big since around the time I was born in Washington, D.C. And, and it wasn't that long ago, but uh, we've seen our, our population go 25 up. 25 years ago. Yeah, about 25 years ago. Go up and down. Uh, and now we're 700,000 okay. strong again. And so I Does President Trump ever call you and tell you what to do, or he doesn't do that? He, he almost never calls me okay. here, although I have had the opportunity uh, to meet with the, the first uh, president-elect uh, and then the president uh, in the Oval Office. That was last year. seems like a lot has okay. transpired since then. So uh, today, there's 700,000 residents. Yes. What's the racial composition of that? Do you know? Is it sure. Um, so we're about a 50% African American, just below 50% African American, which is also very different than um, when I was born in the 70s. Uh, we have about 12 to 15% Latino. Uh, and the balance are Caucasians and Asians, okay. very small percent of Asian uh, Americans in, in D.C. Okay, and what about private equity people? Is that a large percentage or small? <laughs> it's Not too enough. small, too unfortunately, small. Okay. but we'll work on that too. All right, so we are at Hamilton Alive, yep. um, which is presumably named after Alexander Hamilton. Yes. And Alexander Hamilton has a play about him coming to the Kennedy Center. Yes. Uh, are you planning to go? I, I hope to be there. Thank you, of course, for your leadership and your support of the, the arts. Um, and I think we have... Um, we have a number of our school students that will be able to go yeah. to see Hamilton, right. too. And it's not many things that live up to the hype, but Hamilton is one of them. Um, and so many of us have had the opportunity to go to New York or Chicago and, and see it, it, and now it's going to be in, in Washington, D.C., and Good. we're looking forward to a lot of kids being able to go. I think the Kennedy Center has offered a range of ticket prices as well, which will That's make correct. it more affordable for people. So let's talk about the D.C. public school system. Uh, today... Um, you had a new budget come out, uh, $14.5 billion, and you've increased uh, the money for public school education by a fair bit. What are the areas that you're going to have the money going into? Sure. Well, I have in, uh, this is my fourth budget as mayor, and in each of those budgets we've made um, more investments in public education than, than the last. Uh, and it's a very good, good story for, for D.C. because that means more and more parents are choosing our schools. Right. So we're putting more and more dollars uh, in public education, and this one is no different. Uh, we actually were able with this budget to increase our per pupil funding um, by almost 4%, uh, which meets or actually exceeds what 
uh, our internal studies said that we need to do to keep pace with growth. Um, that per pupil funding formula also includes an additional weight um, for our special education spending, um, which is going to allow us to implement a law that's been on the books for four years but hasn't been funded. Uh, we've also been able, through the per pupil funding formula, to fund uh, increases in teacher pay, uh, which we have been very focused on the last 10 years uh, in making sure that our teachers were the best paid teachers in the region. Uh, and this increase uh, right. funded our new uh, contract, and it also flows to both sectors. Um, so that is a uh, right. very good uh, investment for us. Okay. Now, there has been some discussion about perhaps changing the existing law, which came about a few years ago, about who controls the D.C. public school system. Under uh, one of your predecessors, Mayor Fenty, the law was changed so that the um, mayor controls the school system. Uh, I assume you favor continuing that. I do favor that. Um, and uh, what we hear out in school communities is, and what we hear from people who don't even have kids in school, but they know how important public education is to the success of the city, uh, that they want continued investment uh, and they want more accountability. Uh, and what I know is that uh, our system that puts the mayor in charge of these systems with the council's oversight uh, and the state board's involvement in policy decisions has given us that single line of accountability that we need. Now, you, you have to understand, I grew up in, in the city uh, where my own parents, uh, who are very familiar with the public schools and with D.C. public schools graduates, didn't put us through the public schools. Uh, it was a time when we didn't have uh, the type of accountability that our okay. schools needed. So there was a lot of finger pointing. If a boiler was broken or school didn't open on time or teachers weren't hired on time or books weren't uh, in the classrooms, um, the, the people that we work for, the voters and the parents of the District of Columbia, uh, didn't know who to hold accountable. Now there's no question. Okay. Uh, so having a single line of, account of accountability doesn't ensure that nothing will ever go wrong, um, but it does ensure that we have a streamlined way okay. to make sure we can fix things. Okay. And uh, you now appoint the chancellor of the D.C. public I school do. system. Uh, there's a vacancy. Yes. Um, how long will it be before there is a permanent position built? Well, um, we, of course, are very focused. I talked to you earlier when we were talking about Amazon about how ta uh, important talent is, and the same is true for our organization and especially true uh, for the public schools. So, so uh, making sure that we have the right leader for D.C. public schools is on the, on the top of my agenda. I expect that we will, we have this little thing going on on June the 19th, the primary in the district, right. Uh, and right after after that, uh, I think that we will begin uh, our search uh, for, um, for the next chance for D.C. public schools. Okay. So today you have how many students are more or less in the D.C. public school system? About 40-some thousand? Uh, we're just uh, over 50,000. 50,000. 50,000 okay. in uh, with about 44,000 in the public charter schools. So almost 100,000 kids in the public schools. Okay. And over the 10 years of public ed reform, we've seen that number increase each and every year. So what about the, uh, there's been lots of stories about whether school, the children in the schools are doing better than they were five or ten years ago, or they're not doing better. What is your view? Uh, I know that they're doing better, um, but I know we have a lot of work to, to go. Um, to do um, with, with our kids. We know that the energy in our schools is very different. We focused on having um, great adults, fantastic teachers in every classroom, and great school leaders. We've seen tremendous improvements uh, in our lower grades. Uh, last year, my team reports to me uh, that we even saw, we've been very focused on the middle grades in the last three years, that we now have more sixth graders than fifth graders, which means our kids are even progressing on to, to middle schools and our public schools uh, which is which is also great okay. news, uh, but we know uh, that we have to focus uh, more on what we're doing in secondary schools okay. to make sure our kids are graduating um, and that they're prepared for college and that they're prepared for life. Well, what percentage of people who go to the D.C. public schools actually go on to college? Is it a small percentage, or I think that there we we want. Um, 
for kids who want to go to college. We want to make sure they're prepared, and in every public school, they should be prepared to go okay. on to college or to great careers. Uh, and one thing that, one area that we know that we can work on and improve on as we look at our secondary schools uh, is uh, how our school system connects to our workforce system. Uh, so how do the great academies that we have across our high schools uh, connect to, to UDC or other colleges in the area so that our young people are going on to jobs, but not just any job. This is a, a city where you have to um, be able to earn a good wage if you're going to have a high quality of life in D.C. So let's suppose Amazon were to come to the District of Columbia, and they have lots of uh, parents, and somebody, one of those parents called you up and said, I want to put my child in a D.C. schools. Uh, should I go into the D.C. public school system, or should I go to a charter school? What's the difference? They're all public schools, so they, for, for me, the taxpayers of Washington, D.C. pay for all of them, okay. so they're all the same. So there's no, one isn't better than the other. One is not better than the other. They're just different. They're different. Uh, in some cases, parents are going to make uh, choices, and some schools have specialized curricula. Um, some students will choose STEM education or arts education. Um, some folks will want to go to school across the street. Some kids okay. and families won't mind uh, traveling for those choices. And so uh, for us, my job is to make sure that there's a great school in every neighborhood. Uh, and then it's up to parents to make the choices that are best for their family. Okay. And and what about uh, kids who go to high school here and they drop out? Is there a high school dropout rate that's higher in the district or lower than comparable cities? Well, we have too many of our kids. We can uh, we'll look, and uh, we've been going through this as we've been reviewing our graduation data, the kids that start and we have on the books in October that aren't there by um, graduation time. And it's too many young people that become disconnected. Uh, and part of our review of our secondary education will involve the alternatives to high school. Um, one thing that we have found is that some kids, they have gotten so far behind, uh, maybe even in the first semester of their senior year year that there's no way they're going to graduate. Um, and so what would be an alternative for them um, that is going to allow them to progress um, towards a diploma? What about teachers? Um, do you have a difficult time in keeping teachers or do you have teachers that stay here for a long time? Uh, we have one of the best places to work, we think, for, for teachers uh, in, in the country. Uh, we have worked long and hard at making sure that our, our teachers are fairly evaluated and compensated uh, and acknowledged. Uh, one of the biggest things that I hear from our teachers is they want respect. Uh, they want to be listened to. They want to be part of the solution. Uh, and that's one reason why we were very proud last year, uh, after five years of having no contract, we were able to reach an agreement uh, with our teachers. Uh, and so our goal is to make sure that we are recruiting and retaining highly effective teachers. Uh, and we feel like, somebody just asked me this, that uh, in more and more classrooms all over our city uh, that we're, we're able to put in, uh, in highly effective teachers right. and retain them. But it is a tough job. Uh, and uh, we know it's one of the toughest jobs in the city. And so we are always going to have um, people move in and move out of the profession. Uh, and that's why it's important to have a, a pipeline of great uh, teachers. So uh, today, it's very difficult to probably do well in school if you don't have access to, let's say, some type of computer or personal computer. Uh, for children who can't afford this mm -hmm. in the D.C. public school system, uh, does the school system provide them access to a computer and they can take it home? Or how do you deal with that? We think that's an opportunity for us. Um, we have built some incredible um, buildings and facilities, and so all of our kids should have access to high-tech equipment uh, at school. Um, the same is true for our public libraries all across the city where they should have access uh, to computers and the Internet. Uh, we've also worked uh, to make sure that more families have access to the Internet at home. Um, there's work that we can do there as well with working with our cable provider to provide the $9.99 service that um, most of our families could have access to. Um, but one thing that um, DCPS has, uh, is exploring um, is how we improve technology. 
Uh, and one of the technology fixes that we really uh, need to stay focused on is how we can better engage uh, teachers and parents. Uh, and the, using the systems that we have to help parents track attendance, uh, to track homework, um, to track uh, discussions with teachers, uh, we can do better with uh, our technology in that area. Uh, and also with uh, the personal computing needs of kids, uh, I think we can also do better in that area with, with a big investment. Okay. So how often do you, do you visit a D.C. public or charter school? I'm, I'm in schools all the time uh, for different events. Uh, we were at last at the Thurgood Marshall Academy uh, where the Thurgood Marshall kids invited kids from Parkland, Florida um, before the, the March for Our Lives, which was a very uh, incredible experience. So uh, depending on what we're working on, we're in schools all the time. And do students ever ask you about whether there's too much homework they're getting or something like that? They Almost complain? never. I actually think they could get more homework. Really? Okay. <laughs> is that something you're going to say before the election? Or that <laughs> before... Um, I guess they can't vote, probably. So. Um, well, soon it's, it appears so, <laughs> that they will be voting. So one of some other issues you and I have talked about before, uh, one of my favorite issues, the potholes. Yeah. You announced a program recently to fix the potholes by 2024, I think it is. Mm -hmm. So uh, explain why we have so many potholes. Are we different than other cities? And All cities have potholes, okay. David. All cities have potholes. All right. And so where is the money going to come from to fix the potholes? Okay. So this is, this is one difference um, that I've seen, that in too long, um, the city has kind of skimmed a little bit here and a little bit there on our road construction monies. And that, over time, compounds. I don't have to tell you about how, over, over time, what that means for our budgets. Uh, so what we have decided uh, is that we're going to have a five-year program where we'll be able to touch every local road. Uh, and when we're able to do that, we can eliminate every poorly rated road. Um, so you may not believe this, but our, our major arterials are pretty good. Uh, okay. It's the local streets where we have a lot of catching up to do, where we have about 30% of them um, that are not in good condition. In fact, they're in poor condition. Um, so we're going to be able to eliminate that. And eventually, we'll have a schedule proactively uh, where we can replace uh, re roads before um, they become uh, too pocked up. But this is one area um, that there is a tremendous opportunity for our DC residents and school students as well. Uh, and that's an infrastructure. And um, we're talking about local roads, but uh, we have D.C. Water that's building $4 billion worth of tunnels. Uh, we have Metro uh, that we uh, are making a significant investment in. In over 20 years, they're going to spend about $20 billion. We have Pepco that's doing a lot of work, Washington Gas that's doing a lot of work. Uh, and we need uh, the talent uh, to, to do that work. Um, so part of our challenge to our schools is uh, to make sure that we're producing young people who want to go into engineering and want to go into construction and infrastructure at every level, not just at the level of working on the street, but planning the projects and doing the financing for the projects. Um, and we think we have those opportunities at DCPS to train our students uh, to go into our workforce programs at UDC right. and at the DC Infrastructure Academy. Okay, let's talk about uh, my other favorite subject, which is parking tickets. Uh, mm -hmm. Nothing works as efficiently, I find, as parking tickets. If I go park somewhere, within two minutes, I'm just going to pick up something, and two minutes later I get my parking ticket. So how is the, that the parking ticket people are so efficient? <laughs> or is that not true there? Well, they are efficient, um, and this is, uh, this is the one area um, where you never have to pay. Really? You just have to follow the rules. <laughs> you never have to pay. It's one area. Uh, and well, so that... One, but one time you were very kind and you had a ceremony for me and I got oh, a, no. I, a, uh, the key to the city. Yes. And so after I got the key to the city, I drove down to some place and within 10 minutes I got a parking ticket. <laughs> and I felt like saying, don't you know, I just got the I key to the city. city. <laughs> but I, it didn't work. So uh, I had to pay my ticket. So... Uh, 
Um, those people are very efficient, I would say. Yes. Well, we uh, I'm actually are very proud of the, the operations uh, of, of, our, of our city government, which improves uh, year okay. over year. Uh, and we see that in the satisfaction in, in neighborhoods across the city that uh, our government workers show up to get the job done. Okay. So what about safety in the city? Mm -hmm. uh, is, that a, is crime on the way up or down? And, and we, we read about murder rates being very high in certain cities. My hometown of Baltimore has a very high murder rate, and Chicago's had a very high murder rate. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the murder rate here? Um, our numbers are going down in, in every uh, category. We're always concerned about violent crime. And in the time I've been mayor since 2014, we've seen over a 20% reduction in violent crime. Uh, we've had years where we, we've had more homicides than others, and we're always very focused on, on stopping um, those homicides. Uh, we take a holistic approach. Part of it is policing, but the larger part uh, is providing opportunities to keep people out of trouble, uh, and, and and that's what that's what we've been focused on. In schools, we pay um, particular attention to, to school safety too, and I think we have some opportunities to really listen to our young people um, about how safe they feel going back and forth to school, how safe they feel with transportation issues. Um, we ha are also having a national conversation, but certainly here, how safe uh, young people feel about somebody coming into their school um, and hurting them. And so these are some of the safety concerns right. that our kids are dealing with. Um, we also uh, have to be mindful of the impacts of all of this that happens outside of the school on their ability to learn. Uh, and we've been focused about putting health professionals in our buildings, um, with school nurses and school counselors uh, that have some mental health background who can really support uh, kids that have uh, undergone trauma. I don't know if it's a safety issue, but would you consider changing the law? Because a couple of times I've been stopped by policemen when I'm calling on a telephone while I'm driving. Is that really against the law? In that is DC? against the law really? most places. Okay. Um, you haven't and considered changing that? No, I haven't. Okay. And uh, the talk, talk about the D.C. City Council. You were a member of that for a number of years. Um, does that body work as efficiently as you might would like it to work, or is it just wonderful? Um, it's wonderful many times. And uh, I think in, in our city, it's really 14 of us who make uh, most of the, the spending decisions and the execution of the law decisions. We have elected attorney general. We have our delegate, uh, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, on the Hill. But for the most part, uh, we, uh, the way our system is set up makes it efficient um, because we have a unicameral legislator. You have a strong executive. And uh, you can go from an idea to implementation in a relatively short time, much faster than any of the states. And I'll give you an example. Uh, when, I, when I was running for mayor, I guess back in 2013, I was going a neighborhood to neighborhood, uh, and I was in a neighborhood in Ward 8 where household after household was telling me about their school choices and how many of their kids were leaving the neighborhood uh, to go across town to go to school and that they were spending upwards of $30 a month per child uh, to send their child to school. Uh, and that's when I, I realized there's something entirely wrong about the system where we say we have a system of choices, yet we have parents that have to pay uh, to send uh, their kids to school. And so I, I wrote a piece of legislation then called Kids Ride Free um, on the bus. Uh, and that was probably uh, in the early part of the year, maybe January. Um, by May, June, I had gotten the legislation passed and funded. And by uh, August, September, kids were riding free on the bus. Um, right. And so you probably really couldn't do that in a lot of states. Right. But you can do that uh, with a unicameral legislature uh, where you can get funding and where the council member could work with the mayor to get it in place. Right. Now, you mentioned we have 700,000 people living in the district. Yes. Um, how many uh, United States senators do they have representing them? Zero. Zero. And voting members of the House? Zero. Zero. So do you think there's any chance of D.C. statehood, or is that unrealistic? I think it is a chance, um, quite frankly. And I, when um, during the last election in 2016, you know we put a measure on the ballot, and that measure was to ask D.C. residents uh, to... Uh, 
to endorse the Tennessee plan. This is the plan that Tennessee used to get into the union. Uh, many people think uh, that we need a change to the Constitution to accommodate that, because the con people will argue the Constitution says you have to have a capital city. Uh, and it's true, the Constitution does say that. It doesn't say how big it has to be. Uh, and so what we did with the Tennessee plan and the referendum we put on the ballot was we identified the federal district. Uh, and the federal district includes all the main federal buildings, the mall, it excludes our building, City Hall on Pennsylvania Avenue. And the balance of our city limits uh, becomes the new state of Washington, D.C. Uh, and voters overwhelmingly approved it. Uh, and so that was a very good thing. Uh, we have more sponsors of Congresswoman Norton's bill and the companion Senate bill than we've ever had uh, on the Hill. The reason why we pushed it so hard last time is because we wanted to be ready in the case that we had very favorable wins in the federal government, uh, where we had the, the House, the Senate, and the White House all agreeing that there should be D.C. statehood. Okay. Um, we thought we had a chance. We were wrong. Um, but the way these things go, the, you know, it swings um, to the left and to the right, and we want to be ready for the next swing. Uh, the arguments for D.C. statehood, and people have uh, really made it plain that they're political arguments. They're, do we want two Democratic senators or not? Um, they're, not uh, they're not constitutional questions. They've been answered. Um, they're not even questions of fundamental fairness and democracy, because we know what that the answer to those questions will be. It's, it's all partisan. And so we need to just make sure that we're ready uh, for uh, for the next time we have favorable political wins. The other, the last point I'll make about that, David, is uh, we need our corporate friends to, to be involved uh, as well. And so uh, we have a strategy where we're going across the country. We're going to focus on 10 states. Uh, we have a focus on turning a Republican. Uh, and we have a, a focus on our, everybody who is uh, not only concerned about democracy, um, but, but concerned about the impact of not having two voting senators has on the business community. In DC. Okay. And do you have a lot of uh, um, relationships now with members of Congress? Do you have to go up and lobby them a lot on things or just inform them of what you're doing? I, I do go up uh, to make relationships. And I, I had one call, for example, with a Republican senator who, whom I never met. Uh, and I, when I called him, I said, um, listen, I don't want anything right now. Right. But there may come a time when I'm going to call on you for your help. Uh, and I'm not going to start with D.C. statehood, but I'm going to start probably with D.C. TAG. Uh, and D.C. TAG has been a very important program uh, for us uh, in Washington. Uh, it allows D.C. residents to get a $10,000 scholarship to public universities across the country. Uh, and, you know, you can make a lot of arguments, but it, it may keep uh, kids in our schools. It may keep families living, continue to live in our city uh, and have great opportunities across the country. It's been supported on a bipartisan basis uh, on the Hill. It's been a creature of the Congress, not of right. the White House. Right. Uh, and so that, that has been very important for us to maintain where uh, it wasn't supported this time in the White House, but it has support on the Hill. So when you meet with members, does your respect for Congress go up or down? Um, I know they, listen, I know they have a tough job. I watched them uh, yesterday talk to a tech CEO. Right. I don't know if you had an opportunity yes, to see I that. Saw that. But it was pretty funny. Um, right. So they, they have a great country to run, and they have to be responsive to constituents. Um, but watching them try to talk about uh, the Facebook platform to the 32-year-old boy billionaire was... Uh, interesting to say. So um, let's talk about one of the, a couple other areas of the city. Um, you are proposing to uh, uh, kind of modernize St. Elizabeth's uh, a bit. Is that important to your program to update that facility and uh, that area of the city? And Absolutely. So um, for many, some time ago, many years ago now, we, um, we built a new hospital at St. Elizabeth. So the, the kind of the historic purpose of St. Elizabeth shifted a little. Uh, and the balance of the property uh, became um, 
developable, um, and it gives us an opportunity to right. add amenities uh, to to um, that campus, which is a huge campus that just hadn't been there before. Uh, we made a big play uh, at St. Elizabeth's because it became very clear to me when I became mayor, um, there was a lot of talk about all these plans for St. Elizabeth's, but they really hadn't materialized. We did not have uh, a main anchor at St. Elizabeth's to, um, to really encourage the rest of the development. Uh, so the city went in first. Uh, we are supporting a sports and entertainment uh, complex. Uh, in my most recent budget, we have a huge investment uh, in building a new hospital at, at St. Elizabeth's. The first phase of the development is housing, uh, and we've been very proud to work with the surrounding Congress Heights neighborhood uh, to make sure that Ward 8 residents are going to be the residents who are prepared uh, to be among the first uh, buyers of, of that residential um, new residential. What about the development around the wharf area, which is very, and the Navy Yards, is that a major focus of what you're trying to do? Well, that's been a focus of the city for over 10 years, and we're almost finished. So phase one opened. Uh, we'll have another phase that opens. We have retail, restaurants. We've reclaimed real estate in the city um, by peers that are going into the river, uh, for example, and, and getting things done. But that's just a, uh, an example. All of the developments that you're talking about bring people to our city. Um, they bring taxpayers uh, in an all of them, um, many folks are in our city are having children. Uh, we had over 10,000 kids. We have a little baby boom going on in D.C. So we had over 10,000 kids um, born in our city, um, in the, over the, about 10,000 each year for the last several years. So a lot of kids being born in our city. So for us and all of our schools officials, they have to think about how uh, to serve those families. And uh, one thing that uh, we hear from families across the city is that they need affordable child care. Uh, so I think we were just named again one of the best places for millennials. Um, so millennials come here, uh, they you know, share housing for a while, they may be single, they get married, they have families, so they're looking for affordable housing uh, and affordable child care. D.C. has the highest percentage of millennials in the workforce, I think, of any major city in mm -hmm. the United States, so it's very attractive. Um, by the way, uh, your, your office is in the Wilson yes. building. Mm -hmm. I've noticed when I drive by it recently, there's a big yes. like cover over it. Are yes. you hiding something? From what no, are you no, doing no, there? no, no. We're fixing it. So it's a, it's a beautiful historic building that we're lucky to be able to have my offices in, uh, our council's offices in uh, as well, and we're just making sure right. that... Um, we take care of it so we don't have a big, big project 20 okay. years from now. So let's suppose you are reelected, which I presume you will be, and, you, and you're reelected whatever, as long as you want to be mayor. What would you like your ultimate legacy to be when people say, well, this is what she did as mayor? Uh, our focus is on how more Washingtonians can share in our prosperity, period. Uh, so that means uh, that... D.C. residents, well, we're having tremendous prosperity. Uh, how can we have more people have good-paying jobs? How do we have more great schools in every neighborhood with a great teacher in every classroom? Uh, and we know when we do that that people will get good-paying jobs and be able to right. afford uh, to live here. All right. So I'm just curious, the people here, how many people live in the District of Columbia? Wow. All right. All right. How many people here have children in the D.C. public schools? Okay. How many people here were educated in the D.C. public schools? Okay. How many people here think the mayor's doing a good job? Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm going to thank you, Mayor, for a very thank interesting you. conversation, thank and you. thank you for the job you're doing. And um, when I get my parking tickets, I guess i got to pay them, right? <laughs> you do. All right. All right. All right. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, before we get out of here, I, I want to thank uh, one of our board members, Ben Soto. Where are you, Ben? Whose support made this breakfast possible. Thank you. Um, I also want to thank the mayor thank for taking you. time out of her busy day, and of course, David, for facilitating this wonderful conversation. Um, and I want to give a special shout out to my friends um, at DCPS and just allowing us to be your close partner. And of course, to all of you in this room for all the work that you do. So thank you for being with us today, and uh, there's more to come. And have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.